Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Sunday morning, the beginning of this week study. We have five studies, Sunday through Thursday morning. And um, we're going to continue looking at Revelation 12, 13, and 17 in the context of understanding Daniel's uh, 11, uh, verse 1 to 3, understanding these applications that were made. And um, before we begin, uh, could you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning, this new week, and we invite your presence into our study. We know, Lord, that there is much in our lives that does not align with your will. And we just ask for forgiveness and for the power of your Holy Spirit to work upon our hearts, that we can cooperate with you in this work of perfecting a Christian character. Uh, we pray for each person, for each one, uh, for one another, and we pray for those searching for light, that you can guide them, and direct them, help each of us to study your word for ourselves, and to trust in you and not in man. Be with us now through thy spirit as we open your word together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning, everyone. So uh, on Thursday, we were finishing off uh, addressing this idea of Revelation 17. Uh, the question was regarding how do we know the time? How do we decide from what perspective the angel's explanation um, of five are fallen is? Right. So that's what we want to examine a bit more detail today. But before we go there, some of the things that we haven't considered is uh, some of this structure of Revelation itself and this narrative, this vision, as we go from chapter 12 all the way to chapter uh, 22. So those last 11 chapters in the book of Revelation are to be separated from the first 11 chapters in the sense that this, this book has a structure of the first 11 chapters and then the last 11 chapters. So this 11-11 idea to make 22, the symbol of restoration, is something that we see throughout scriptures, the scriptures. And uh, you see this in the patriarchs, you see this in the story of Joseph and, and other places. Now, when we are looking at chapter 13, uh, we focused a lot on that first beast. So this first beast um, is referred to as the beast. The one in chapter 12 is the dragon. And then we have this second beast in chapter 13. And what beast is this? If we were to describe this beast, we've got the dragon, the beast, and what is this beast, the second beast? The second beast is going to make an image to the beast. But what is this beast? What's another name we can give to it? Well, I've heard it called the Earth Beast. That's, that is, is supposed to, to be the U.S. Okay. So what or if we call it? So if we called it the false prophet, we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Can we refer to this beast as the false prophet? That's what I heard it referred to. Yes. So, so that's what we have. So when, when we get to chapter 14, you know, <coughs> it's going to talk about in Revelation uh, 14, we have the three angels' messages. Um, and it talks about the beast and his image. So the image of the beast <coughs> is made by this second beast, which is the false prophet, right? And then when we get to uh, Revelation 16, we're going to have these plagues that are poured out. And we know that the sixth plague 
the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, that's Revelation 16, 12. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the dragon of Revelation 12, the mouth of the beast, that's the beast, the first beast in Revelation 13, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the second beast. I should be okay. So, so often when we read Revelation, we're not keeping in mind that there's this continuity of this part of the vision from chapter 12 throughout. That is, it's telling a narrative or a story. We tend to study the chapters in isolation. So we just, well, we're studying this part, you know, the plagues or something. Or then we're studying the beast of Revelation 17. Or we're studying Revelation 14. But we don't consider the whole narrative, that, there's, that they're referring back to things that were mentioned earlier. So when we have the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, we can then see that false prophet has to be that second beast in Revelation 13. Now, so when we get to Revelation 17, and we now are given this next beast to look at with the whore riding this beast, right? So this woman riding this beast. All of this other stuff has gone before, that it's already been part of this narrative. And um, so when we get here, we have, we have to keep in mind what's being talked about before. And so we have this, uh, the beast that thou sawest that was and is not shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. That's verse 8 uh, of Revelation 17. And when we think about this, well, what is this beast? Right? Is it this beast that's here in Revelation 17? Or is it the beast that is in Revelation 13? Right? So these are things that we have to look at in order to understand the context of Revelation 17. Now, we had decided, at least I had decided, um, and nobody's really objected to it. Maybe Stephen a little bit he has trouble with it. Um, but I think we can see the reasonableness, or at least the possibility, that in Revelation 12, the seven forms of government can apply to that beast that we call pagan Rome. But that's not consistent to apply the seven forms of Roman government to the, to the seven-headed, ten, ten-horned beast of Revelation 13. That wouldn't be consistent. That beast, it's much more consistent to say that the, these kingdoms, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, papal, United States, UN, to apply those head, the, the labeling of those heads to the beast of Revelation 13 is consistent with the imagery that's there. But it, it's, it's not consistent to say that it's the seven forms of Roman government. Now, it's not impossible, but we think it's much more likely that the heads represent these different nations rather than uh, forms of government for the beast of Revelation 13. So when we get to Revelation 17, the question is, how do we address these heads? Because if they were the seven forms of Roman government in 12, could we say that these are the seven forms of Roman government in Revelation 17, or since they were the um, the seven kingdoms, so to speak, um, in Revelation 13, could we just apply the kingdoms here to Revelation 17, or is it neither of those? Is it some other seven heads that are being referenced here, or is it even a mixture? Not not in the sense of some and others, but in the sense that it could be applied both ways. So, so we have different options on how to 
interpret the beast of Revelation 17. Now, we also know that uh, this is the period in which the United States exists. So we know in Revelation 13 that one of the heads receives a deadly wound. And so what we have said is that's the papal head that receives the deadly wound, which makes the most sense. And that when we get to Revelation 17, and it talks about an eighth head, that this is a resurrection of the papal head. <clears throat> now, this could also apply even if you had the forms of Roman government. But, you know, there's there's still many things that we have assumed at, in our interpretation that we have to go back and examine. So we're trying to get rid of our assumptions, things that we've just inherited by being Seventh-day Adventists on how we interpret this. Some of these ideas are not part of Millerite history or understanding or even early Adventist understanding that we believe. And, and then we have to say, is that those this new understanding a progression of light that God has endorsed, or is it some kind of error that's meant to deceive us and put us on the wrong track? So that's why we look at uh, the pioneer understanding. Now, we do know that God's also led this movement in its understanding of the heads of the beast of Revelation 17. So, so we've never abandoned that view. Even when we examine this, we say, there's something there that we that God has led us in understanding, and so we're going to accept that unless there's a good reason not to. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to examine it. <clears throat> and also, we know that Colin has made an application of these heads uh, to the presidents of the United States, just as many other people have tried to label them with popes and different things like that. Um, that idea can on the surface seem um, out of place. So we, we have to decide if that application makes sense. And I think that there's there's definitely uh, virtue in it. So that's what this whole study on Daniel's last vision is really trying to determine. We're trying to determine, can we make these applications? Now, the way that we understand prophecy and again, this is just kind of a re review, but we know we look for the fulfillment of prophecy. That is, if we're going to make an application to our time, we don't reinterpret the prophecy. We don't say the prophecy is actually about our time. We're saying the prophecy was fulfilled in the past, and the past is repeated. The past, the history and connection with the prophecy that has been fulfilled can be repeated in our time. Not as a direct prophecy, but as a repetition of history. And that repetition of history follows very specific rules. And those rules have to do with the template or the model that was given in Millerite history. That is, we sometimes refer to it as the seven thunders or the three angels' messages. They, they represent somewhat the same history. And that history then of Millerite history is now being repeated in our time. And so when we make an application, we have to say, well, how was that applied in Millerite history? So in Millerite history, we know the time of the end is 1798. We know the papacy ends in 1798 and the United States begins. And that's Revelation 13 tells us that. And Ellen White supports that idea in 1798. This nation arises, and it's represented by the two-horned beast of Revelation 13. So these are all things that we, we know, but we have to keep them in mind as we try to make this application of Revelation 17. So in Revelation 13, with the second beast, um, he has horns like a lamb. So we know that these two horns tie us to Medo-Persia. Right. That's the symbol of the two horns like a lamb. Well, in Medo Persia, it's a ram. But, you know, and normally lambs don't always have horns. They, they, they grow as they get bigger. So the idea that the two horns like a lamb means that this is at the beginning of the United States. 
That's my understanding. These horns would grow as it goes along. But it also spake as a dragon. So it has the voice of the dragon, which is the beast of Revelation 12. Right? So it's it's got characteristics of Medo-Persia, uh, but it also has characteristics of that we would attach to pagan Rome. Now, those characteristics are going to be manifest later because he doesn't speak as a dragon in 1798. This is going to refer to what's going to happen. Now, it says, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the papal beast is going to receive this deadly wound. And the United States that rises up in 1798 with this separation of church and state is now going to cause the earth and them that dwell therein to worship this first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, we know that the healing of the wound is something that happens later because it receives a deadly wound that that wound isn't healed right away. Right. And when we look back just at what that was talking about, I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So this seems kind of odd that we have this dragon that gives its power to the beast. So this is pagan room. And, uh, it's going to talk about this one of the heads doesn't tell us which one, but if it's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, then it would be the fifth head um, that receives this deadly wound. And it's going to uh, be healed. And the world's going to wonder after it, but they're also going to cause uh, everyone to worship the dragon. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? So they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Now, well, the 42 months we would put from, you know, 538 to 1798. So it's going to go back here. So it's going to give, it's going to be bringing us back. So when it says it worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, that's paganism. So we can see in the Catholic church that paganism has been dressed up in Christianity. We call this papalism. And that's what must be referred to, that when you're worshiping this beast, you're also worshiping the dragon. Right, you're also pagan. So, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and then that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this is talking about the 1260 years of the papacy. Now it's going to bring us to this beast coming up out of the earth, which is going to be the second beast. So it's going to bring us through that whole history of the 1260, all the way to the end when the second beast arises and comes up out of the earth, the United States. So you can see this, this progression of the beast of Revelation 12, which is pagan world. Then the beast, first beast in Revelation 13, that's papal world. And then the second beast. But all the time, the dragon is there, right? The dragon is in this papal beast. And the dragon is also in the second beast. Now it says he spake as a dragon. Now we can see what's the significance of speaking as a dragon. Because we know a dragon is a serpent, what is that referring to?
What does it mean to speak as a dragon? I would say to be a despot. Okay. Well, if we think back to the serpent in the garden, because the dragon is a serpent, what is it that the serpent does in his speech? It's a deception, right? So the speaking as a dragon has to do with Deception, right? It's not really talking about its persecutory power or its its uh, authority. It's talking about how it's speaking. And so when it speaks as a dragon, Ellen White says that this, ha- of course, has to do with its laws, right? So how are laws deceptive? So, okay, so we find this in the great controversy. <clears throat> okay, so this is talking about the lamb like beast. This is page 442 of the, the great controversy. Actually, bringing this up so you can see it. She says, The beast with lamb like horns spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound is healed saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by the sword and did live. So we can see that, uh, what is it that he says when he speaks like a dragon? He says to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by the sword and did live. So this speaking as a dragon is this idea that they should make an image to the beast. So she says, the lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation thus represented. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exerciseth all the power of the first beast plainly foretells the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. The statement that the beast has with two horns causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance, which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. Such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government, to the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. The founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the church with its inevitable result, intolerance and persecution. The Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Only a flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can any religious observance be enforced by civil authority. But the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns, a profession pure, gentle, and harmless, that speaks as a dragon. 
saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast. Here is clearly presented a form of government in which the legislative power rests with the people, a most striking evidence that the United States is the nation denoted in the prophecy. <clears throat> okay, so so we can see here, this is something, you know, we, we should all already know, but it's it's this voice of the dragon, and the voice is going to be expressed in its laws that are contrary to the Constitution. <clears throat> so we need to keep these things in mind as we look at the Beast of Revelation 17. Now, <clears throat> so we know there's going to be these miracles as well, right? He doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of man. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now, there's lots of disagreement about exactly what this means. We know that there's that miracles are being done. And this idea of fire coming down from heaven ties us to what story uh, in the Old Testament? So would this be Elijah on Mount Carmel? Mm -hmm. Right. So there, uh, the priest of Baal can't make fire come down from heaven, but Elijah can. But at the end of the world, they will be able to make fire come down from heaven as evidence that they are correct. So what does this mean then? <clears throat> what is this miracle that that is being referred to if we look at it in that context. Because it's going to be through this miracle they can deceive people. I mean, we could take it literally, but I don't think that that's what's meant. Anybody have any ideas about what this means? What what deception is this? Well, Satan is 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 impostering God. Okay, so he's so, going to try to do the same thing that God has done. Okay, so we're going to have Satan's personation of Christ, which is going to happen after the close of probation. That's going to be the sixth plague that we have Satan's personation of Christ, according to the Great Controversy. But this is the United States, and, and we could say, well, this is just referring to that Sunday law at the very end, you know, where it's going to come up to the death decree. And, and we do know that there is going to be miracles and deception. But here is fire coming down uh, from heaven uh, in the sight of men that's going to deceive people. And we know also that... Um, uh, we're going to have that he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we would say, if we're going to say that the image of the beast speaks, so there's going to be an image of the beast that speaks, that would be, again, the speaking would have to do with laws. And those laws are going to cause uh, this death decree. So we could say that verse 15 of chapter 13 is regarding the death decree, right? Which is going to be after the close of probation. So is this deception here? Um, I mean, maybe it's progressive, but is it primarily looking at what happens after the close of probation? Because remember, 
we teach that there's there's a test called the image of the beast test, which precedes the Sunday law. Right. And, and when we talk about the Sunday law, we're talking about the Sunday law in the United States, that there's going to be an image of the beast formed. And that's going to be a test because those who don't recognize the image of the beast being formed will be deceived by the Sunday law. That is, the image of the beast is the deception. They'll fail the Sunday law test. Not only will they not be able to stand in it, many will be supporting the Sunday law test because they don't recognize the image of the beast being formed. Right? This, this is what Jeff has taught. So, so we have this image of the beast and, and the image of the beast test. Um, when I asked Jeff about this in 2015, um, because he was talking about the joining of the two sticks. And, and I can't remember if I asked when is the image of the beast test or when did I ask when the joining of the two sticks was. But he just said, let's say I asked when's the image of the beast test and he said at the joining of the two sticks or if I asked him where it was the joining of two sticks, it was at the image of the beast. The point is that it's the same point that we have this image of the beast test and this image of the beast test is connected with uh, events uh, from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. That's how Jeff would have understood it back in, in the past. I'm not sure how he understands it now. <clears throat> and the joining of the two sticks is the Protestants who see this image of the beast being formed, who some may have been Sabbath keepers, but many would have been Sunday keepers. But as they see this image of the beast forming, they are going to join with the people of God in keeping the Sabbath, and they will pass the Sunday law test. That's the joining of the two sticks. So, so we can say that this is something that's progressive. This is the forming of the image of the beast. But there comes a point where he has power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak. Right. So this image of the beast is being formed. It's going to be formed before the Sunday law in the United States. But there comes a point where he has power to give life unto the image of the beast. And, and so we can see here that this, this is just kind of grouping this all together. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, say, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. So when we deal with 666, we remember that Miller applied this to the number of years of pagan Rome, right? That is, he's going to mark pagan Rome as coming into history when the Jews make this league with the Romans in 158. And then he's going to count 666 years to 538. Now, we have also seen that there's a period of 666 years from the, the third seven times in Leviticus 26, which is the siege of Jerusalem by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, by Babylon, and uh, 70 A.D., which is uh, referring to the siege of Jerusalem by Roman Deuteronomy 28. So that there's 666 years between that. And that this 666 is a symbol of an aspect of Babylonian uh, mysticism that is passed from Babylon to Rome. Now we also have 666 that goes from Judean independence in 128 or 129, depending how uh, people date that, to 538. So that 
takes pagan Rome and attaches it to papal Rome, as does the 666 years of Miller. So we can see that papal Rome is inheriting this characteristic. But we see that the United States also has this characteristic. Now, one of the things we can think about, too, here with this is that we have seven heads. Now, why do we have seven heads on these beasts? What does the number seven mean? Completion. So it's a type of completion or perfection. But here, these are, are beasts, unclean beasts. So... We see the number seven in the sanctuary, dealing with offerings and so forth. There's seven clean animals on the ark. So if we have here this uh, seven, what about the number 666? How does that relate? To the heads. We have seven days in creation. Which day is man created on? Six. The sixth. So if the United States is the sixth head, is there any significance of that with this number 666 in relationship to the United States? Or is that just some something that I'm reading into this text? Because the United States has this 666 attached to it as well. But if it is the sixth head, right? Because it rises after the papacy. Hopefully I'm not moving too fast because I know a lot of this is sort of review. But we should be able to see then that, that there's something about these dragging the beast and the false prophet. But then when we look at um, Revelation 14, as we said, uh, it's there's definitely a reference here, um, the beast and his image in verse 9. And then when we get to um, Revelation 16, we're going to have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Um, and then we're going to have uh, Revelation 17, and that's going to follow. Now, the thing that people have a hard time with, who sort of think that the book of Revelation is just chronologically moving along, well, we know that we have this seventh last plague, right? So this seventh last plague, the plagues are still future. They're going to be a lot later. But... So it's going to do this repeat and enlarge. So when it gets to Revelation 17, it says, There came up one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying, Come hither. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, when we when that is said, there's going to be this description of this whore. But the judgment of the great whore doesn't happen in, in Revelation 17. It happens in Revelation 18, right? In Revelation 18, we're going to see this. But, you know, we in our mind, we just kind of separate these things out. But it's going to give this description of the great whore in Revelation 17, but not the judgment of the great whore. So in Revelation 18, we then see the judgment, Right? of what happens to uh, Babylon, right? Um, and it's going to have the mourning, this this mourning over the Babylon we can see in parallel to Tyre, the mourning of, of, of the city of Tyre in its destruction. Um, and then we're going to see, you know, all of the celebration, Marriage Supper of the Land, Rejoicing in Heaven, 
the thousand years and the defeat of Satan and then the new heaven, new earth. And then finally, uh, the closing chapter of Re Revelation, chapter 22, uh, talking about um, basically what, what it's going to be like in God's kingdom. So, um, so when we get to Revelation 17, then, it's going to talk about the judgment of Babylon, but it's going to give us a description of Babylon, right? And it's going to use the beast that it had in Revelation 12 and 13 to describe this, this Babylon. Now, it says, I'll show thee unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Right? So as we said, he, he's, John's going to be carried away in the spirit into the wilderness. Right? So he's going to be brought to the time of the papacy, the 1260 years. That's the wilderness. And he sees this woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, we know that this beast doesn't have crowns, right? So that's what we've noted. It does have, it is full of names of blasphemy. So one of the characteristics of the beast of Revelation 13 is that it doesn't have crowns on its heads, but upon its heads is written names of blasphemy, right? Um, so that was just to make sure I get this right. Um, so in Revelation 13, it said, if he's going to speak blasphemies and upon the heads, the name of blasphemy. So, uh, it's going to say the name of blasphemy. In verse 13. Here it says full of names of blasphemy. It puts it in the plural. But it doesn't say that the names are written on the seven heads. Or the ten horns. It just says that the beast is a scarlet, scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy. So what does it mean full of names of blasphemy? Why this imagery? Because when we look at a name of blasphemy upon each of the heads, we're saying that this has to do with being in the place of God, putting, you know, the kingdoms of this world in the place of God, its leaders in the place of God, speaking words against God, reviling God. But this scarlet colored beast that the woman is riding is full of names of blasphemy. That's the kingdoms of this world. Okay. So, so because it has this characteristic, I don't think, so it says having seven heads and ten horns. I don't think we can apply these seven heads to the seven forms of Roman government. Like we do in Revelation 12. Any thoughts on that? I know some of the people who usually talk aren't here, but Steve is not here, Dwight's not here. Well, I would like to know why you wouldn't apply them, because, I mean, they, the the uh, Roman heads were pagan. I mean, they didn't. They didn't want anything to do with the true God, or they didn't know the true God. They 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 worshipped demons, right? So. so yeah. So, well, it is, but but the blasphemy here would be much more related to uh, uh, what we see in the papacy. I mean, obviously, all of these things are blasphemous, blasphemous, right? Um, all of these nations of the world, because the idea of having a king that somebody stands in the place of God is blasphemous, blasphemous. I pronounce that right. 
right? So that's blasphemy. But uh, this scarlet color beast would be the kingdoms of this world, not just the forms of Roman government. Oh, of course. Yeah, because in, in Revelation 12, there's crowns upon the heads. There's nothing mentioned about blasphemy. But when we get to Revelation 13, they have names of blasphemy. And we're saying if Revelation 13 is Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, etc., then this beast is much more connected with the beast of Revelation 13 in that respect than the beast of Revelation 12. And if the beast of Revelation 12, if, if the pioneers are right, that it refers to the seven forms of Roman government, I don't see how we could have the seven forms of Roman government as being the seven heads in Revelation 17. Also with the ten horns, these can't be the natural divisions of Western Rome that happens as a result of uh, the fall of, of pagan Rome that are then going to be the nations of Europe under papal Rome. These ten horns must represent the, the kingdoms of this world at the end of the world in their united form, which would be the United Nations. But these seven heads, we would still say, would be map, battle on Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, etc. Right? So, so even if we put the seven heads in Revelation 12 as the seven forms of Roman government, that wouldn't be consistent here. We couldn't just say, well, Revelation 17 is just the seven forms of Roman government. So I don't think that we can take Revelation 17 and make that application that the pioneers make regarding the forms of Roman government. So I just don't think we can do that. Based on, on how we've studied this. So we would say we were correct in accepting that the seven heads represent these progression of these kingdoms from Babylon to the United Nations at the end of the world. And we can see how the United Nations is um, this continuation of Babylon. We know there's lots of characteristics that bring the United Nations back to this idea of Babylon. And then the ten horns. So now we're saying that the seventh head is the United Nations, right? But the ten horns are the United Nations. Now, is that consistent? Does that make sense that the ten horns refer to the kingdoms at the end of the world, but also the seventh head refers to the same thing? Why would we have one of the heads being the UN? but also the ten horns being the UN. Do we have an explanation for that? Unless there are ten that, that are foremost. Okay. I don't know. So what about another solution here? Okay, so... So we can say whatever we want to say. We can say that these, this beast is full of names of blasphemy. But it doesn't say the seven heads have names of blasphemy written on them, right? So maybe there's something that we're missing. So I'm saying that it could be consistent with how we've interpreted this. But I still have problems with the last head being the UN and the ten horns also being the UN. Now it could be that the seventh head is the UN and uh, the ten horns refer to the period in which we have the Sunday law. Yeah, so um, I don't know if they're likely become ten literal divisions of the world. I don't need know that, that the ten no, have that. literally fulfilled, right? But I do think that the symbol of 10 does represent the entire world, right? So we have lots of examples of that. That is, you know, three is a completeness in the sense of unity. Seven is completeness in the sense of perfection. 
10 is a completeness of the world, and 12 is a completeness of the church. They're all complete numbers. 3 times 7 times 10 times 12 is 25, 20, right? So, so these three symbol, four symbols of completeness, one of them is the world. So the 10 horns represent the world united at the end, which is the United Nations. But we're saying one of the heads is the United Nations. And, okay, and so, so how, maybe we could read Revelation 17, 3 as the woman is the one that's full of names of blasphemy and just skip the seven heads and ten horns. If we're looking, trying to look for them being full of blasphemy too, maybe this verse is just talking about the woman in general. Okay, uh, that the woman's full of names of blasphemy. But either in either case, uh, the point is, that the names of blasphemy aren't on the heads in this. Yeah, way. I know. Right. I know. They, so now I'm they, more. So however you want to read it, it's just that in Revelation 13, the heads have names of blasphemy and no crowns. In this case, either the woman or the scarlet beast, or maybe both of them are full of names of blasphemy. But this beast has seven heads and ten horns. And there's no crowns and no names of blasphemy upon these heads or horns. And yet we're saying that one of the heads is the United Nations, but the ten horns also are the United Nations, right? Now, if this is, um, so, this he's carried away in the spirit into the wilderness to be shown this woman riding this color, scarlet colored beast. Now, some people will just say, well, you know, this is just back to Revelation 13. But remember in Revelation 13, the woman's not riding that beast, right? It's not the leopard like beast. This is a scarlet colored beast. So it's not the same beast. But yet we know that the woman, the papal beast, is Revelation 13. But here the woman is the papacy. So so again, the woman is supposed to be one of the heads. And the ten horns are all supposed, supposed to be one of the heads. So what if the seven heads are something else? That, that we haven't considered. And since we haven't considered it, I don't know what they would be. But we know that these seven heads <clears throat> um, are going to be a part of a riddle, right? Because it, it's going to say these seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, one of the aspects here is that these seven heads are... The hills in Rome, right? So that, that, that is how people often read this. In Revelation 17, verse 9, you have these seven heads, there's seven mountains, and these are the hills of Rome. So that means the hills of Rome are going to represent something, right? Upon which the woman sitteth, and the woman being the papacy, is seated in Rome. But then it says there are seven kings. So, so these heads are seven mountains. And it says, and there are seven kings. Now, does it say the seven kings are the seven mountains? Does it say the seven kings are the seven heads? No. They're two separate things, aren't they? Well, I don't know. But does it say that? No. Okay, so it doesn't say that the seven heads are seven mountains that are seven kings, right? It doesn't say that. 
We could read that into it. But it just says the seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. And it says, and there are seven kings. So could we say that the seven heads represent the city of Rome through which the papacy then controls the kingdoms of this world? Well, that makes sense. Okay. And so these seven mountains are referring to, in symbol, even though they're they're literal, right? They're literal seven hills. We're not mixing, mixing literal and spiritual here. We're just saying that those seven mountains represent the government of the civil government of the papacy. That is, through Rome, the, the papacy controls the world. Now, those seven hills also are hills upon which pagan Rome set, right? It's set upon seven mountains or seven hills, the seven hills of Rome. So then when it says there are seven kings, it doesn't say that the seven kings are represented by the seven mountains. Okay. It, it doesn't say that, right? But but we read it that way. So what if these seven kings have are not the seven mountains? But the seven kings represent the presidents of the United States at the end of the world. Or something else. Now, some people will say, well, the seven kings are seven popes, right? That's how it has sometimes been interpreted. Because you could look at popes as kings. But you could look at presidents as kings. But then we'd have to try to say, how do we know the time element, five or fallen? How do we do this? So what we have done in the past, what Colin has done, is he's he's taken uh, the seven heads to represent um, the kingdoms of the world, right? And then he makes a leap saying that the seven kings or the seven heads can be interpreted as seven kings and that those seven kings can be the presidents of the United States. But what if they just are separate, that they're not using the seven kingdoms to parallel um, as, as the same thing as the seven kings. So the seven heads are not the seven kings. But that this is something different at the end of the world. So that means this would bring us up to our time, right? So, so I know this is a little bit speculative, right? But I'm just wanting people to consider this what it's saying and what it's not saying. And that maybe there's some other way in which we can understand this. So we know that the papacy, the woman is seated in Rome, right? Because that's the seven heads are representing seven mountains in this case. And so the seven heads, if they're representing seven mountains, are not representing Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, world, papal, etc. They're representing something else. That this beast that she's riding is the kingdoms of this world at the end of time. That is, uh, she's now seated in Rome. And Rome is control controlling the world. It's the last kingdom. So then it says, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and it is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. So this becomes a problem now, right? So, and this has always been a problem, no matter how we look at this. Because the beast that was, and is not, is it this beast, the scarlet colored beast, or is it the beast of Revelation 13? Because there's a beast that was, 
but it is not, and yet is, right? And so how do we relate but The this? beast is, <laughs> this is a male beast, though, so it would be a civil power, right? Um, well, let me see. Um, I mean, when you look at the end of time, but if you look at this beast here, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. This is the papacy, right? In Revelation 13. And then again, it says his head. And see, this is confusing to me, too. Okay. But yeah, but think of the the papacy as feminine. Okay. Because it's a church. But what I'm saying is that here in Revelation 17, where it says the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth unto perdition. Now you're saying here this beast, this definitely is not, because um, um, it's going to be masculine, right? So I'm just going to look it up here. Yeah. Um, or we could say because the Pope is now ruling all 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 of the governments blatantly, I mean flagrantly. I mean we know he's behind the scenes in all yeah. of them anyway, but now it's gonna be open. Then we could say, Okay, that's a masculine power because it's church state merged. I don't know. I mean this is so multi layered. Um It's actually in the neuter form. So it's not. Oh. Um, yeah, this is all neuter. It's not actually uh, masculine at all. Okay. In Greek. That should say it. Okay. <laughs> You should say it. Okay. So it's neuter. Um, so, um, so it is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. If we're going to, uh, I'm just going to see if Young's does, does that. He has he and. <laughs> Neuter doesn't transgender. <laughs> That's funny. As some of them have neutered themselves, haven't they? Yeah. Oh, anyway, talking about forms of cover. Probably, <laughs> they, they, but it says it's neuter in in the Greek, so I don't know why they're using the masculine form. Uh, but anyway, um, the beast that was was does not. Even he is the eighth and is of the seventh. So this beast. Now, the question is: Is this beast the scarlet colored beast? Or is it the first beast of Revelation 13? Is this a reference to the leopard-like beast? So again, you know, I mean, I know I'm confusing things, and I'm not trying to confuse people. I'm just trying to be analytical about this. That maybe there's something that... Because the idea here is if there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Then it says the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. But it doesn't say he's the eighth king, right? And is of the seven. This could be of the seven heads, Right of Revelation 13, and he's one of the seven heads. The seven heads, one of the heads that was wounded, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Right now, we know this is in the explanation. So the way the pioneers looked at this is that they said he has this vision. And then he's going to have the explanation. The explanation starts in verse 7. So the 
the angel's going to explain this. I'm going to tell thee the mystery of the woman. And of the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. So when it says the beast that was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, um, they're going to put this at the time of John. Now, the beast that thou sawest was, so this doesn't, to me, doesn't really make sense from the pioneer's position. Because uh, the beast that you saw was, it is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. How would they interpret that? Because again, if this can't be talking about uh, the different heads, they have to say it was and is not. Now, if it is not, is it true that it is not and was in the time of John? Right, you understand what I'm saying? So this is dealing with the time element. So the pioneers, when they go to the riddle, they say five are fallen. That's five forms of Roman government. One is, that's the imperial, and one is not yet come, that's papal. But in this explanation itself, the angel is saying, the beast that thou sawest was. Now the beast that thou sawest must either be the papal beast, right? Or a beast that the woman's riding on the kingdoms of the world. But it could it be said that it is not at the time of John, right? So uh, somebody says, no, it can't be, right? So we can see that there's a problem with uh, taking this explanation as from the time of John, because the beast can't be not in the time of John if it hasn't even arisen yet. Correct? Right. So, so it's going to say that in verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. And it's going to say it again in verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. So we have to determine what that beast is that he saw and that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, right? It's going to send out of the bottomless pit and it's going to go into perdition, right? Right. So it's going to do both, but it's separated here between um, verse eight and verse 11. So I don't see how you could put this explanation in the time of John. Unless you're saying that the beast that thou sawest was, but but how is it not? Because if the beast is is pagan Rome, you can't say pagan Rome is not just because it's imperial Rome. So it has the explanation has to be from the time in which he is perceiving this, not from the time in which he's living. Because it was, we can say that about the papal beast. Now, this papal beast, this can't be applying to the scarlet-colored beast. And why is it that the beast that thou sawest was and is not? Why can it not refer to the scarlet-colored beast that the woman's riding? Why must it refer to the beast of Revelation 13? Is it ever true that the kingdoms of this world were and are not and, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit? Could we apply that to to the kingdoms of this world that the woman's writing? Is there any way we could apply it to I mean maybe there's something I'm missing. 
So if we're saying that these that this scarlet colored beast is uh, the kingdoms of Europe that she's riding. In this scarlet colored beast. Um, the kingdoms of Europe, it was in control of Europe. And then Europe comes to an end. But does Europe come to an end in 1798? Or they, no, of course not. Yeah. So, so I mean, people could argue this progressive degradation of Europe in some point, and and the United States becomes the main power. But I would just have to say that the beast that is not would have to be the papal beast of Revelation thirteen, and not the scarlet colored beast. And remember, the beast refers to the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, right? So so this is still in that context. And it's not saying the scarlet-colored beast that thou sawest was and is not. It says the beast. And I think you would naturally go back to the other beast. Because this is now distinguished, this one that the woman sitting on is the scarlet-colored beast. Now, you could say in verse 7, though, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the scar and of the beast that carrieth her. So here, the scarlet colored beast is referred to as the beast, which hath seven heads and ten horns. But if he says the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend over the bottomless pit, again, you know, is this referring to the beast of Revelation 13 or to this beast that he's just talking about? And that and that's still not clear. So if this beast is not, it either has to be the papacy in some way or something else that we're not considering. Right, because the one thing I can point out, that that no matter how we try to interpret this, there appears to be things that don't fit. And that what we have done in, in trying to understand this is we have ignored some details. We gloss over them when we try to sort through uh, Revelation 17. We just ignore certain things. But but we can't ignore them. We have to look at everything. Everything has to fit. And again, I don't have a complete answer to this, but I'm showing you where some of the things don't follow in these various interpretations. We can see, for one, is that the pioneer understanding will not fit here. So this beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now, now what is this ascending out of the bottomless pit a reference to? Well, it reminds me of Islam or Apollyon. No, he went into the bottomless pit. The other one came out of the bottomless pit. Okay. Um, you know, I'm just trying to get this here. Okay, so we have a Revelation 9-1, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose the smoke out of the pit, right? So that's going to be dealing with Islam. Um, and Revelation 9-11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And Revelation 11, verse 7, and they shall, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, 
Uh, the thing here in Revelation 11 is it talks about a beast coming out of the, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. And it hasn't told, told us about this beast yet. It's going to tell us in 17 verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was, is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, so this ascending out of the bottomless pit of this beast must already be understood prior to Revelation 17. Because it's already referred to in Revelation chapter 11. Now, uh, in Revelation chapter 11, we know that this refers to, um, Atheism, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is going to be the slaying of uh, God's word. Right? These two witnesses. Okay. So now we're going to have a beast that thou sawest was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So again, this is a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. So, so whatever this beast that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, it has a past, it has a present, which is not, and it has a future. It is a satanic power, right? No doubt. Yeah, so we have Islam that uh, is going to have... Uh, the key of the bottomless pit, and it's going to open the bottomless pit, and and they're going to have a king o king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now we often refer to that king in Revelation nine eleven um, as to the idea that they have uh, Othman, right? Now that is um, these are going to be locusts. And uh, locusts don't normally have a king, right? Says in right. another, locusts don't have a king. But yet these locusts are going to have a king, right? So this is going to be often. That's how we've interpreted this and understood it, you know, for forever, right? So, so this is a satanic power. So we we would say that this is atheism. This beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit that shall make war against them. We don't say that this is, you know, the papacy. We apply this Revelation 11, 7 to what happens during the time of the French Revolution. Okay. So, so there's still something that we're not, we're not seeing here. Um, I know we've got about like 10 minutes left to try to, all we're doing here is, is laying out some of the problems and we're going to uh, try to unravel these and, and make sense out of them as we get through this week. Um, so the beast that thou sawest was and is not. So this beast, if it was the papal beast, the papal beast is not an atheistic power. I mean, obviously, it doesn't recognize God, and it has some characteristics that we would attach to atheism, so much so that in Daniel uh, chapter 11, so let's go there. So maybe we can solve some problems here. So in Daniel chapter 11, you're going to have, uh, in verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. That's blasphemy. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is, is determined shall be done. Right? So we know that this is the papacy. This is the king of the north. The king shall do according to his will. It's not France. Right? It's the papacy, right? It says, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. 
Uh, but in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces. And the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Right. So this is uh, the papacy. This is what it develops into. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. So we know that the king of the south there is going to be France. It's an atheistic power, right? And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, right? That's going to be the king of, of the north is the same as this king, right? So the king of the north, that's in verse 36. The king of the south, atheism, atheism is going to come against the papacy. And then in 1989, the papacy is going to come back and conquer the king of the south. Right? So that's how we understand this. So um, there is this period in which the king of the north has been defeated. Right? That's the days of one king. Right? So we can compare this to Tyre. But there's lots of different parallels that we have. So I still don't know, you know, how we're going to sort through this. Well, I do know that as we go through it, we're going to be shown more and more by the Lord. Like I'm thinking of Daniel 2.21. Mm-hmm. He changes the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and, un- and knowledge to them that know understanding. And also from the little that I've been reading about what Francis is doing and viewing what he's saying, he actually had and he probably continues to have rituals where he's actually praying to Lucifer, but it's in Latin. And everything that's been pronounced by this guy lately, I mean, there are people in the Catholic Church that are coming up against him. They're revolting against him because he he's actually destroying whatever vestige of Christianity was in the Catholic Church. And so there's a big schism happening among Catholics right now. Yeah, Because he's the woke pope. Oh, he is absolutely disgusting. I don't think he's a god in, in any sense a godly man. I think he's arch demon. I really believe that he's arch demon possessed. Yeah, he's definitely an evil person. Um, so, I mean, there may have been popes in the past. I don't know. You can't judge a pope's heart, but who may have had some sense of wanting to be Christ-like and. Just, you know, they're just brought up in the wrong religion. Um, but, you know, when it comes to Francis, I mean, there's nothing really about him that's Christian, I would agree. But um, so but we know that the papacy as a system is a satanic power. Even though it professes Christianity. It, um, but it does come to an end in 1798. Right. So the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So. So the point is, whatever this beast is, if this is in the time of John, I don't see how we can have a beast that was and is not in the time of John. And we also. uh, We couldn't put that. I guess we could sort of try to put it into our time. But I think the best place to put this is 1798 in that context. But there's still much that I don't understand about this. And we have, you know, we've studied the Seventh-day Adventist Revelation 17 and had disagreements over it for a long, long time. And this movement has had, uh, I think, the most satisfactory explanation of Revelation 17. But there's still problems. That is, there's still some things that don't add up. And I'm not saying that, you know, we have to have a new interpretation. Maybe there's just 
another explanation of how to understand this that's consistent with what we taught in the past. But it's definitely not as simple as just saying this is, you know, in 1798, because if we're going to apply the five kings, you know, the five that are fallen, um, and we're going to make an application to those presidents of the United States, we would have to either have them fulfilled in the past and create a parallel. But maybe these seven kings are just directly the presidents of the United States. But then how do we account for their, for that? So we'd have to say in the time in which we're talking about that the beast is not, that means the beast is not, and it has not yet ascended out of the bottomless pit, that that's still future. So that time in which the beast is not is all the way from 1798 uh, to now, but specifically it would be referring to now not to 1798. But is the angel's explanation where John is, is in our time, if we're going to say that the five are fallen. And and then how do we get John there? Right? That would be the other question. How do we get John to be in our time, specifically from this, these passages, to make that application? So there, there, there's a number of problems that we have to solve. Now, Colin's situation is just that you're going to take a repeat of history. And, and maybe that's the solution, is we'll just say, this is a repeat of history. But then if we're going to say five are fallen and one is, and those are seven kings, maybe there's some way in which we need to understand that that's, that's not the way we understood it before. I know I'm not I'm not helping anybody here at this point, and, and I'm not meaning well, to. Well, you are. Because you're probing us to think, and I know that just as as the pagans have had to give way to the way to the papacy, the papal empire is going to give way to a totally satanic empire. So we're going to see the papacy itself morphing more and more into global Satanism. Yeah. This is yeah. what we're, what's happening now under Francis. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it could look at like I'm just doing like Parminder where he just asks all these questions and never gives you an answer. But I'm not doing well, that. We're, we can't say blatantly, this is the way it's always been. This is what we believed in. Sure. And, and we were right in what we believe in. I mean, a lot of it anyway. But now things are evolving, and they're evolving so quickly. And, I mean, I don't have your background or anything like that, but I can see uh, intuitively, and because just by watching what's what little I do watch of this so-called Pope, I can see that he's that's the prime instrument of Satan, of transforming, attempting to transform the whole world into Satan's empire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and there's just something we're missing, is all I'm trying to say. That there's, because we, when we look at prophecy and things are not yet fulfilled, uh, we don't often see them. But now as we're entering into this controversy within this movement, I think it's meant for us to look at this and re-examine what it is we understand about Revelation 17. And and then we can come to some more clear, a, a clear understanding of Revelation 17. But but this is a difficult problem, right? This is not this is not simple. And I'm not saying that by by Thursday we'll have the complete answer to this, but at least we should have an understanding of clearly what the problem is in our understanding, and that will open up the door to further light. That's that's the purpose of what we're doing here. I, I feel bad, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm just being analytical. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. I pray that those watching this video uh, can have a clear understanding of the problem and um, that we can continue to study these things and uh, 
we can receive light. We pray for each person in their personal struggles. You know, there's health problems and other problems that face us. And so we give our lives into your hands and ask that you can use us. We pray that we can continue to pray for each other. Um, even those that um, revile us and persecute us, we pray for them, Lord. And uh, help us to represent you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>